You didn't like it yesterday? Yeah, it wasn't good enough. Is it something I said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I knew it. We're talking to Joe Cantrell, the videographer who was here last night. He's always here on Saturday nights for these conversations. Are you going you gonna to try this this time? Or are you going to... Yeah. <laughs> and, and there was a glitch because technology glitches. So we're going to try to get a complete 30-minute uninterrupted recording tonight of our conversation, today, of our conversation. I'm Robert McBride. Carlos Calmer is the music director of the Oregon Symphony. Hi, good afternoon. And Gabriela Lina Frank is the composer whose music we'll hear first on the program tonight. Welcome back. And Thank you. We had a, a, a little tense conversation backstage just now um, because of where you have chosen to make your home and also your wonderful facility for young, not necessarily young, I'm sorry, composers mm -hmm. to study and wildfires in California. But mm -hmm. your place is safe mm -hmm. as far as you know. Yes, we're safe. Um, I live in, the, in a tiny town called Boonville, um, and it's uh, just 1,200 people. It's an old logging town in Mendocino County, about two hours north of San Francisco. And I'm, I'm a Berkeley native, so I've always been a uh, San Francisco Bay Area-ite. And if you had told me that I would be leaving the, the vibrant metropolitan area of the Bay Area, I thought it would be for a city like Portland or Seattle or something like that, not for Boonville. Um, and what started to happen a couple years after we moved in was the real threat of climate change. And um, our area has you know, seen the conditions that are perfect for fires to happen. Uh, we have been volunteering at various relief efforts. We're getting trained in prescribed fire burn, which is what the Native Americans used to do. You go out with torches, and you torch large acreage of land. I look very comical in my getup, you know, with my hat and, and my big boots and everything else. And, you know, I'm, I'm a composer by trade, but you pick up, if you're a, a citizen of the world, you pick up these other kinds of skills. And I also uh, have a wonderful partner, my husband, and he was supposed to be here, but because of the fires that are going on and the outages, um, he's opted to stay home, and unfortunately, I have to leave. I, I stayed here for one more concert. These guys are playing so well, it's very hard for me to remove myself when this is the pinnacle of my profession, when I see all my hard work pay off and such a warm uh, hug around my music. But uh, I need to get back. Yeah, well, our hugs to you and your husband and, and your home. And, and let's talk about your Composer Institute a little bit before we talk about the music tonight and other things. I love that you started that. What inspired you to do that? And what do composers have to do in order to go there and work? So I had no plan of starting a nonprofit academy of music, none whatsoever. Uh, I had a, a really vibrant career. I've been championed by wonderful conductors like Carlos. And uh, my first time coming to Portland was through Third Angle and I've been working with 45th Parallel Universe. You guys have a lot of things that are going on here and are very attractive. And so my life was full. I didn't have to think about taking a job at a university, although I love teaching. I love working with emerging voices. And then in the summer of 2016, my husband and I, we took a cross-country trip to New Mexico. We just loaded up our fishing rods and our dogs and drove through um, Trump territory during the election. And it was, it was hard for me to get out of the bubble of the Bay Area and to see um, cultural de de devastation and economic despair and to see this context, it began to make sense to me why our discourse as a, as a nation was becoming um, so divisive. It was really distressing. And I began to realize that I had to do what I thought was the opposite of this energy was that instead of protecting just myself, and my ethos, and, and my physical being, I had to open up. And what I decided to do was that because since we had just left the Bay Area and bought a beautiful home, we have about 20 acres, we own two farms, um, and I had a wonderful community, many of them Oregon musicians, that I needed to give a boost to my emerging colleagues and to do so with an eye towards inviting people from many different racial backgrounds, many different cultures. So we have people who are not classically trained that have always secretly wanted to write a string quartet. 
And so we'll get them a tutor to teach them Western notation. And we've had um, uh, our jazzers are killing it. They, have, they really want to write for string players. They can't get their hands on them in the same way. And they improvise everything. So the mystery of writing everything down is really attractive to them. And we do a lot of outreach. So where I live, there's a high school, a very poor high school that's mostly attended by Latino students. These are the sons and daughters of the Latino vineyard workers and farm workers. And they're mostly boys that pick apples and grapes after school. We did a concert with them last year and they wrote string quartets. And I brought in my, my performer friends from San Francisco that want to go to wine country and we put them up really nice. And they play their music. And my composers see that. So they see in their group that they are of diverse background, they have the kind, I have a vibrant career, but then they see how important it is for me to volunteer. And I go in a couple times a week to volunteer with these students. And then the mentors, they write them chamber music works. So my very first round was the musicians from the Third Angle group here in Portland. And I just knew that they, these guys can play, this orchestra can play, but they're also good people, they're humanists. And you were using that word yesterday. I find that kind of spirit here. So they were among my first mentors, and they play my young composers' work. Naturally, not all of them are young. There's no age limit. And we provide childcare, you know, so that we support parents and mothers especially. There's a lot of things that, because it's literally out of my house, and I'm not beholden to anyone, all these things I've long observed over decades of being in this industry that I think is a shame that we're not addressing, but I can do. As long as I find the money for it, we can just do it. So now we're in our third year. We are scheduling around the fire seasons. That has been a hard reality, is that we can't hold certain um, residencies the way I would like. But we've then gone into other parts of, of the United States as a result. So we've had one here in Portland, and that was in October 2017, when the first round of fires were hitting the, the vineyards, and we just relocated to here. But we've gone around different places. And then we also work on getting our graduates of this year-long apprenticeship that they have with me, and I give them Skype lessons, and so it's, it's really rich. Um, I don't want this organization to be a pass-through, I mean, uh, where once you come through, that's, okay, we've done enough for you, go out with, the, with our name in your bio, and um, we try and get them paying work. And I've been able to collaborate with um, Third Angle, 45th Parallel, uh, among other groups, to actually commission my composers, those that are ready for professional work. And for many of them, it's their first professional commission. And they can continue to take risk and grow. But our latest round has been commissioned with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And I'm composing red, and it's there right now. It's able to convince them and say, you want to work with me, you got to work with my kids. And I want you to give them a reading of the work in progress so that it's, you know, we really guarantee. I mean, you just kind of push from the inside has been sort of my, my way of operating. So. For me, it's been transformative. Completely unexpected, completely unexpected, but um, I'm kind of a mama bear, you know, in, <laughs> in some ways. And we're only in our, concluding our third year, we're still a young organization, but we work with 70 composers now. And I can tell you everything about each and every one of them, all just wonderful people. You have to read about her in your program notes and about the piece, Walkabout, that we'll hear tonight. Sort of the icing on the cake for me in a way is that the man and the woman who met fell in love and got married and became this woman's parents <laughs> met when they were both in the Peace Corps. I mean, it, just, it all fits together so beautifully. But the piece tonight, Walkabout, is a walkabout in Peru. Mm -hmm. Take us there, please. Well, uh, Peru is my mom's native country, so my dad was the Peace Corps volunteer. And my mom was the native Peruvian that he was supposed to help, you know, with, um, either educate or, I mean, there's so many different goals that the Peace Corps has. Sometimes it's to improve the sanitation of water or, or to um, educate women on contraception. Or, so this is in the 60s. And um, most of what they were trying to work on at this time was um, starting little businesses. And so where my mom lived, Chimbote is a coastal town that's known for helping supply the fertilizer business with guano and uh, fish meal, anchoveta, we call it. And it's, 
My mom took me to where she and my dad had their first date, and I remember <laughs> thinking it wasn't very romantic you know, at all. And she was 17 and a half, and my dad was 21. They were children. I think about how young they were, but they only knew each other for three months, and they decided, yeah, this is, we can do this. And they landed in Berkeley in the 60s, if you can imagine, because my dad was a, was a UC Berkeley student. So I did not have the opportunity to travel in Peru until I was in grad school. I was mature, and I grew up with very racially diverse children. And I more identified with children of immigrants than I did children from the Latino community, if that makes sense, because in California, the rich Latino community there is Mexican. And uh, Peru is a you know, completely different culture. My mom was you know, the only Peruvian that I knew that was really real to me. So my best friend, I remember, Niasha was half German, half Zimbabwe, and Emiliana was half French and Vietnamese, Marquesa was half black, half Japanese. You know, this, this was what was normal with that. Multiple languages were heard in a household, but English was our first language, and we ate strange lunches when we would brown bag, you know, my mom's empanadas, and everybody else had PG, PB and J. Um, so my identity was something that was real in some way than intellectualized in others. You know, we were purveyors of food and poetry and music in our household. And I had to go into a place of imagination. My mom would talk to me about uh, the jungles that there, or um, I had to go there. It was really great training as a composer, is to go there and try and imagine and sound. You know, you're, I'm trying to transport you. So walkabout is that way. In my mid-20s, when I started my walkabouts in Peru, my mom was always by my side. And this was her opportunity, she grew up quite poor, to see parts of Peru that she was never able to see. And she would always say, okay, this trip, for two weeks, we're going to be in Cajamarca. Cajamarca is a historic site where, <laughs> where Pizarro wiped out the Incas, Alto Hualpa, when there was a feud between the half-brothers of the Inca Empire. And we go there, and we see the incredible, there's a couple of Inca temples that are still there, and, and the first colonial churches. And, and my introduction to Peru was a very personal one. My mom comes from a large family, so we would always have family members that we would stay with all over different parts. So the piece you are going to hear is a distillation, both in my imagination, but then in some techniques that are typical of Peruvian music, but reworked. It's not going to be a literal translation of Peruvian folk music. I don't find that very interesting, and I would, I would fail anyway. If I, it's, it's to me perfect the way it exists when you listen to traditional panpipe music or charango music. It's like the little ukulele that they have. And what I try and do is get at the essence of it and then make it like me. I'm a mestizo woman. Uh, my mom calls herself a modern day Inca woman, for instance. You know, and it's important that artists go into that place of imagination. So the first movement, I should let you talk about it because you know. He, he's done quite a bit of my music. Maybe you can put in context with, with <laughs> well, some of the others. I actually find it so fascinating, <laughs> all these things that you tell us. Um, so this is a piece, technically it's a, it's a concerto for orchestra, so it features, uh, everybody in the orchestra <laughs> will have something very important to do at some point in the piece. And of course, in terms of being a walkabout, there are four movements, and each movement is dedicated to something very specific. But the thing that happens is that this thing that is specific is only the starting point for where Gabriela is going with her thoughts and where actually this idea takes her. Uh, be that the soliloquy in the first movement, which essentially opens you up to you just go somewhere. And yeah, it, technically it ends up being a movement for strings, but yeah, fine. Or uh, the idea of a slingshot uh, being used in the 16th century, which is the second movement also. And uh, Gabriela, I think, also never loses this idea, which, uh, I mean, it's meaningful to us musicians of structure and architecture. It's so beautiful always when I think, oh, and here it is, and there it comes back, and slightly varied, and all all of that happens. And uh, the third movement, called Haili, uh, which is uh, the Quechua word for prayer, is um, 
I don't know whether you even like to, it's not that I want to label it, but I remember conducting your three Latino American dances and thinking, as wonderful as that music is, I completely am in love with the slow movement. And slow movements are something like, wow, Gabriela can go places that are just very deep. Because when you hear her talking about her roots and Peru and the relationship of walkabouts and Peru as a country, you think, oh, you're going to hear something native. And that is not what it really is. Um, there might be a native origin and there might be a native idea sometimes, but that's a point of departure. And then everything else is Gabriela Lena Frank. Uh, and uh, the last movement, which is maybe the most uh, literally taken from Peru, is actually the one where I say, and now let's go to a party. And the party is the festivity, to be exact, is a festivity where hundreds, thousands of people gather and they play these indigenous flutes and drums. And it's a very propulsive, very in her version, because I'm sure if I would hear it in the original, it would be different. I would say like, ah, that is where the Torcada comes, but Gabriela's version is different. It's also, aside from the fun of a festivity, it's also there is an eminent danger, meaning the, the darkness of the color of the cello, basses and uh, bassoons together with the drums create something. And also I think it's very important to realize that the, until you get to the moment where the festivity really starts, the music has a intense dramatism. So you kind of have to go until whether you reach the street, use your imagination, what actually she means by that. And this is a brilliant piece of music. I'm very, very proud. This is, I mean, it's a young piece of music. It's two or three years old, something, yeah. uh, barely. 2017, I think. Yeah, the so, and we are the third orchestra in the world to play it. And we are the first orchestra who's going to record it for a CD. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> How long did it take you to write this piece, do you remember? That's, you know, <laughs> that's always a hard question to ask. Um, I cheat a little bit when I write music because um, I don't tend to get writer's block. I have the opposite problem I have. I'm, I'm trying to focus on one melody and shiny, you know, something else comes up I'm on the radar. And, and so I'm trying to always, but I'll make a quick note and put it down. And so I often have a lot of material left over. And I think it's a bit like, um, when De Niro, Brando would start improvising, and you don't know what to do with this extra material, but it's great material, maybe you can build another movie around it, but there's a lot that winds up on the cutting room floor. And I'll save it, I have all these binders that I've saved for more than 20 years now in my house. I mean, that would be the most devastating loss for me in a fire, is losing all of these notes, because nothing's scanned or anything like that. But I, th these ideas are homeless until I find a piece for them. And so I've spent many hours, and so when I started this piece, I would just start going through my binders and seeing what still had some fire in there. I can see my imagination, because I worked on this stuff, and seeing what's coming alive. And often I have more skills than I did when I first came up with the idea. So I would think, oh, I can do much more with this now. I can weld it together with another idea, and it's a transition, joining point of these two ideas, that's what I'm going to use. So sometimes it's the alchemy of old ideas that produces something new. You're not literally just pouring in something that you worked on before. So I don't know how to answer this question. I mean, it, maybe it took me 10 years to write it, but I signed the contract only a year before the, you know, the delivery date. So um, it took me a long time. It took me a long time. So in that regards, it's kind of the same question formulated a different way because yesterday uh, when you left we were talking about Beethoven and the word struggle came to mind and I also told the story that um, in the very first uh, subscription concert we presented this year we had Oscar Bettison from uh, the East Coast here with a world premiere and I asked him, do you struggle? And he said, Oh boy, I struggle until it... And we both said, you don't sound like you struggle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
mean, of course we do. I don't want to let anybody down. There's that struggle. You know, I don't want to bring shame on a family name. There's that struggle. So there's an emotional struggle whenever you are in a public eye of, of any kind. Um, there's fatigue. And it could be physical, but it could be mental fatigue. Do you remember when you were in school and you had to get that essay done and you're just like trying to pull ideas out and you're just hating every word that you put down because you're not feeling that inspired? Sometimes you can get some good stuff done even when you're not inspired and you just let it sit and you come back the next day and there's, it, it flows. So I think it's, um, you have to be courageous if you're in the business of being creative and creating material. I have to have a factory up here, but it, it has to produce original material each and every time um, and yet still have a consistent voice. So I struggle with maintaining a healthy balance and a healthy vigilant eye on, on always having a clear brain, a clear heart. That that's a lifestyle choice that you make. So I may choose, for instance, to not go out with friends the night before I want to have a good composing session. And um, sometimes people think artists are a little bit strange for protecting themselves, but it's because they're trying to contain that struggle and trying to maintain an optimum situation for creating work. So yeah, I do struggle, and, but it's, it's a chosen one. So I'm privileged, I, I, I do well in this profession, and I try and talk about how to embrace the struggle when, when it becomes hard with my composers. We don't talk about the habit, how to compose in the conservatory, which is something that's really ironic to me. I mean, imagine if you were <laughs> a violinist and you go in for your weekly violin lesson and you and your teacher, you put the violin on the table but you don't pick it up during the lesson. You talk about your fingerings, and you talk about the phrasings you might do. Maybe you sing a line, but you don't ever actually play, and then you go away. That's what a composing lesson is like, is that you talk about you know, how magnificent something's going to be, but you don't compose side by side. But I think you could. I think you could. I think you could look at idea and teach somebody how to take the same idea and make it blazing or make it tragic. And, and then the struggle would be minimized if composers had more tools, if writers had more tools. So um, I understand the question. I really do. But I think um, struggles to be embraced and can be embraced when we have more tools for it. I think many of our struggles as humans would be more easily managed if we had more people like you to lead us. <laughs> Gabriella Elena Frank, you are wonderful. Thank you. And fortunately, she keeps coming back here every few years for yeah, aren't we lucky. 45th Parallel or Third Angle or the Oregon Symphony. So thank you, Carlos, for bringing her here and wonderful music. And the whole concept of struggle brings us very neatly to the next two pieces on tonight's concert, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, which is all about <clears throat> the struggle and the triumph at the end. And then in the middle, Ludoslavsky's Cello Concerto. How many people know Ludoslavsky's Cello Concerto? Wow, not very many people. Because <laughs> th this these are the first Oregon Symphony performances. And it's a crazy piece. Completely. And it reminded me <laughs> of the classic John Callahan cartoon of, of the, the doors to the mental ward with the sign that says, please do not disturb any further. <laughs> <laughs> and the way this concerto is presented tonight, it so enhances that I, I guess inherent nature of the music, at least it's one way of looking at it. Louis Slavsky said, no, it's just music, don't put a story on it, but wow, it kind of seems like one crazy guy versus the whole rest of the crazy world. Well, I, had, I, I, I was thinking about that because this, uh, the meaning of this piece took off pretty much immediately after it was premiered, and ever since the meaning was, it's kind of handed over from one uh, person to the next in the sense of, Actually, what Lutoslavsky meant is the struggle of the individual against the oppression of the masses. The individual is the cellist, and the masses are we on stage. And the oppressor is, well... I'm key what? oppressed. Well, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and there is some truth, and the fact that Lutoslavsky was absolutely adamant saying, no, that's not really what I meant. 
is maybe bound to the fact that Lutoslavsky uh, didn't want this piece to be understood in a political way. He, it's maybe more the st struggle of the individual human against mankind. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, there are two things I wanted to tell you. First of all, it's crucial when you hear this piece, which is so unusual, that you keep a very open mind about what the piece is, because it's very unusual, even the way it's written and the way it's performed. And uh, so, don't don't have an interpretation. Just go with what it is, and then you later can think like, uh huh, maybe that, maybe the other, maybe the third. The reality is, and that is, I think, for me, very important to say it is that I have. Never I have encountered, and I always said, for me, music is a language. And you can interpret it that the way you want, but this piece you are going to hear, the Ludovsky Cello Concerto, is so much ingrained in language as a tool that you will understand. That, actually, I think is very true in this piece. You have one individual who will, through a cello, talk to you in the most disparate ways you can think. He will talk fast, he will talk slow, he will yell at you occasionally, or maybe at us, he will argue, he will start crying and sobbing, maybe there is laughter, there will be very defined indifference. And uh, the role of us as let's say, the, the other part of the equation, we are the mass, is first of all, we are oppressive. So, we, the orchestra, do not agree with the cellist. And we yell at him sometimes. Sometimes in a very brutal way. But the, that is not how this piece that lasts 24 minutes, whatever it lasts. Um, that's not the entire explanation because when you have somebody to talk, giving a talk, this person will be at times be able to take you on a journey, and that will happen tonight, today in the afternoon too. Sometimes he says something, and we's like, okay, I, there we go, and then we go for a while, and then he says something outrageous, and we like <laughs> stuff like that. The technicality of this is also, it's a very visual part of the concert that you'll see because Johannes is not only one of the most stunning cellists there are in our day and age, he's also, a, he is also, an, there is acting through the cello. So really open your ears, open your eyes. And the last thing I want to tell you, which is a technicality, but it's, so you understand how this works, is in a normal orchestra setting, I lead the orchestra in the rhythms, whatever they are, the entire first violin plays one voice, the entire cello another, etc., etc., everything. In this concert, everyone has a distinctive individual voice. Lutoslavsky notates everything meticulously, but writes, well, how you interpret what I write is up to you, and please do not try to match your neighbor. On the contrary, play independently. So, my role is actually not only limited, but quite a while is it is like, go. Stop. <laughs> Trust me, I enjoy that very much. <laughs> and? It's time, we now have to stop. <laughs> so glad you're here this afternoon. You're gonna love this concert. It will blow your mind at least three times, I promise. <laughs> Carlos Comer. Robert McBride. Good job. Yeah.